um, so think about how artists work and how scientists work, right? Artists uh, and your partner is one, so you know that they always talk about where their inspiration comes from and everything. And scientists only do that after a couple of beers at a meeting, because <laughs> it's not like formalizable. And so it's a bit embarrassing if you're claiming that you have a sort of an algorithm, the scientific method that is like considered an overall algorithm to find the truth. So we should move away from this view of doing science. Science is a highly creative, uh, you know, um, art. Uh, so Robert Rosen, the, bio the theoretical biologist, called it the art of modeling. And he says, you know, the, the way mm. you, um, first of all, pick out what to model, and this is relevance realization, right? Exactly. The frame you set, the, how you pick the variables, how you parameterize your system, this is the art of modeling. The map, the creating the map. Creating a map, and you can yes, have different yes, maps. You yes. go through London and you have a city map that shows you the streets where you walk on. You have the tube map. The tube map's really weird. It's all distorted, idealized. Uh, that's what philosophers call idealization. It's not just abstract, but all the distances and the directions are wrong. But it shows you the <laughs> connectivity. This is what you need when you're on the tube. So you need different maps in a complex world. And the maps, if you put together the, the street map and the tube map, it doesn't get any better. In fact, it gets worse. <laughs> and this is exactly how science works. <music>
So before we start, let me just uh, explain my interest, mm -hmm. why I'm so excited about this work. And there are two. One is uh, sort of personal, the other is more professional. And actually the personal interest is because I want to connect the two words, the professional and the personal world. But let me just say that like, uh, I come like a lot of scientists from a sort of like my realist uh, point of view that was implicitly behind this, the kind of science or, or worldview that I was I was doing, not necessarily thinking a lot about it. And uh, then, you know, midlife crisis or something like that, where you start questioning why you do what you do, not necessarily, what, you know, what you do, but why, what was the reason and where are you going with this? That led to, you know, to a lot of things, including like John's uh, 50 hour lecture uh, and a lot of other stuff from science because i'm a scientist that opened up my world towards this uh, still naturalist but let's say no reductionist uh, uh, looking at the world or looking at science and so then i, I started to dig deep like why do i really why am i really interested in this and the, the conclusion I have now is that basically it was untenable for me to leave this, uh, what I call lived dualism, where you do something in the lab, you study the world, you do science, you find these propositions that, you know, that are true and is beautiful and discover a lot of things, but that world is, you're outside of that world, right? And you go home and you mm -hmm. hug your kids and suddenly you are in a different world. So it's not necessarily dualism in a philosophical sense, but you really live in two worlds and like the dinner conversation is awkward because it's really hard to uh, explain to people what you're doing in the, the other world. Plus, there is this psychological effect on the scientific stance, I mean, on, on the scientist because of the scientific stance that sort of forces us to dis disattach from the subject we are so much interested in and it's such an unnatural move so i was looking for uh, you know worldviews ontologies frameworks where where I, I i as a scientist i have my place in my own ontology so that's 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 the personal reason and the professional reason in in being interested in your work is because i think and maybe this is where we'll disagree we'll see I think that the world, the AI world, is going in a direction where we are creating systems which are still mechanistic, algorithmic, but the way we relate to them is very much organismic. Yeah. So even engineers who will have to manage these systems control the paradigm within which we, we will control the systems because they are AIs inside. So they start to behave as organisms. They start to behave as agents and we will need to have the, the engineering paradigm of dealing with them. And so I think it's very, from even, even if you don't like the metaphysics and everything inside this, this work, the, the, the actual pragmatic question is there and it will be useful for especially AI engineers to look at this. So these are, sorry for the long introduction. These are my two reasons and I just wanted to, to frame, frame the, the discussion a little bit so you know why, what and why I'm interested in this. But uh, so let's start slowly introducing the naturalizing relevance realization paper. And I'm, by slowly, I mean, let's paint like a broader picture because there are a lot of concepts there that might not be familiar to people who, mm -hmm. you know, come from the, the, the realist point of view. Uh, as you said before we started uh, the recording, uh, the claim in the, the, like the contentious claim in the paper that uh, cognition is not computational, this made such a big buzz on Twitter uh, yesterday, but even like a month ago when I, when I tweeted some because of the conversation with Anna. And it's so interesting for me because I don't think uh, like John's re relevance realization uh, claims make such big buzz, although they are pretty much the same. <laughs> they are the same. That's what we're saying exactly. in the paper. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's like I don't know. It's like also like there's a marketing angle here, like how to really shake people or how to make them interested, and even if they sort of like. Uh, 
there's a lot of emotions and everything at least it opens them up to uh, actually to listen to this so um so yeah let's talk about the paper uh, let's define stuff like computation computationalism or natural agency relevance realization uh, like chaba my friend asked me like how do you define computation etc so let's 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 you know frame the thing so before we go into computation, the bigger frame is, is very simple. And that is we live in a world that is not necessarily subdivided into problems or phenomena that are well-defined, right? That's mm -hmm. the uh, Savage's idea of a large world. And that is the first step you need to do if you want to make sense of that world. And that's where relevance realization exists, is that you need to define the problems you want to solve. And the whole argument about computation is downstream of that so it's more the enveloping argument and this is often misunderstood is about how far can you actually formalize the world and so what do i mean by formalization i use the term in a technical sense which was used by david hilbert in his formalization program in the 1920s and 30s and to just you know do a sloppy job at defining it but still get the point across it means the process of putting ill-defined problems into well-defined frames. So it's the problem of relevance. It's the, the frame problem in, 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 in AI. So it's how do you get from an undefinable environment or ill-defined environment to a well-defined environment where the problems are clear. So a large world here is a problem in, uh, is a world in which there are problems that are not well-defined and maybe not well-definable. A small world is a, a world in which everything is well-defined. So this is not about size or anything like that it's about uh, yeah actually, actually i i like i would like it's too late to do this but closed and open world it's a better terminology for this for example for me there like, because it's not about the size but the frame right you you could call it that way yes uh because in the end the the small world is always uh delimited although it can be infinite of course but it is delimited by a formal framework and that formal framework uh, consists of rules uh, to solve a problem you have to have uh, a search space you have to have a starting point an end point where you want to get to and you have to have a, a solution space where there are possible solutions and all of these are abstractions okay so this is the, the main point the philosophical point here is that if you think that computation is the world then you mistake an abstraction for a reality that is not yet well-defined or abstracted in any sense. And so uh, Whitehead, the process philosopher and philosopher of math uh, mathematics, of course, he also uh, said, this is, is called the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. If you mistake an abstraction for reality, and this is what's happening here. So the, the argument is much less um, about in what sense is this computational, but it starts much earlier, higher up. Is this formalizable or not? If something is not formalizable, it cannot be computational. And then we come to the definition of computation, and that's very simple. And there we use Turing computation, church, all the equivalents, you know, that um, uh, it, it's Turing equivalent. That's basically it. And then people will come and say, oh, but that's an outdated term. No, it is not, because it is the only way to have a well defined concept of computation. Okay, all the other uh, uh, concepts are not well defined, uh, except when you say, as many people say, okay, it's just physics, you know, but then we have a word for that. It's physics. Okay, so that there's two problems. Why call physics computation if it's just physics? And then, of course, after you've done that, you're still going to make arguments that what your computer does is what is happening in the world. So you are actually then switching that concept inside your argument or your head. And you talk implicitly about Turing computation, but you claim you talk about physics. Okay, and then the two get muddled up. So you have to have um, a clear concepts here. And then somebody will stand up and especially on social media, somebody will come and say, oh, it's just about semantics. Okay, if your aim is to just predict and mimic phenomena in the world with a computer algorithm, yeah, you don't care about that. You just want to imitate nature by a simulation, fine. If you want to control and, and, and predict, that's sort of uh, more of an engineer's kind of approach to nature, I would say. But if you're a scientist, you want to understand. And if you want to understand the world, semantics is everything. So this 
criticism, I never let it stand. It's just semantics. Yeah, because everything about understanding the world is about semantics. And it's crucial that we get those terms right. And here, I just want to say one more thing. But what do these terms do? Why is it so important to know what we're talking about? It's because concepts do work in your theoretical framework. So you always have to think about what kind of work does this do? And my main criticism is that uh, a lot of the concepts that have been redefined in a computational sense, they come from biology, intelligence, thinking, understanding, all this, uh, you know, the discussion about semantics, for example, in LLMs, but they don't mean the same thing anymore as they did. But people don't realize that. And what you get is a massively confused discussion about the capabilities of, of algorithms, about the nature of the world. You get a whole chain reaction of confusions. Yes. So this is the fundamental background. <laughs> yes. So what I, I was thinking while you were talking is um, not necessarily the philosophical side of this, but the psychological. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we help people who think that physics is computation? They have to do the thinking outside of the box, which is basically what this philosophy is about. So, but it's hard to go there without understanding this concept that the map is not the territory in a very deep sense. And so, because what I feel is that when people say physics is computation, they are living in a small world literally yes. right yes and so it's and the move to get out of it which we basically we do it but it's they do it probably implicitly you have to do it to live that's the point of the paper mm -hmm. because you couldn't live without dealing with the big the, the large world but since you know if you if you take a young Maggie christ argument the world that we constructed around us is so small worldish that we sometimes forget that there's a forest outside the city. Absolutely. Okay. That's wonderfully put. I mean, I, so, so here's a bunch of things to say. First of all, what's really threatening to a lot of people who are interested in computationalist approaches is that they take this up as, as me saying you can't do computational models. That's absurd. Uh, computational approaches to neuroscience and, of course, to simulation of galaxies and whatever you want in nature are extremely successful because they are very good, especially in the non-living world, to, uh, to get the behavior uh, right and also to get the underlying mechanisms right. And they help us study those mechanisms and much more. They help us in cases where there are lots of variables involved, like if you simulate a whole galaxy, um, to, to keep track of so many different factors. So I'm not saying computationalism is bad as an approach. So having that out of the way, why is it uh, so difficult for people to, to accept, it's funny how triggering this argument is, okay? So first of all, it's funny because this view that the world, the, the brain or the world is a computer is very recent, okay? So it, mm -hmm. it goes back to a few mavericks like Konrad Zuse in the 1940s, but nobody took these guys serious. When it really gets serious and when it becomes mainstream is in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. Mm -hmm. And not earlier. Okay, so that's surprising to a lot of people. Also, what people don't know is that the theory of computation wasn't intended for this at all. It was a theory of a particular human activity, a computer in Church's paper and Turing's papers in, in, in the 1930s. That's a person. Okay, that person is usually an underpaid woman who sits in the back of the engineering department or the accounting department and calculates, right? This is what humans do. And it's an activity that is a very specific activity. It's what we do by rote. You give a person uh, data and a bunch of rules and they execute the rules on the data. And that's what algorithms do today. So this is the or origin of the theory of computation. And Turing, during his whole life, resisted it being applied to the whole brain. So here's the problem mm -hmm. with the brain. The brain hasn't evolved for calculating. The brain has evolved to keep you alive. Okay, basically. And so the brain has evolved to solve the problem of relevance. What is relevant and how to act in a given situation, which is, as we're trying to show, not the same as calculating at all. And has, you know, like people like Joseph Weissenbaum have argued in the 70s already, it's about judgment, not calculation. These are fundamentally different categories as concepts. 
And so it's important to get the concepts right for you to be able to ask the right kind of questions. Even if you're a strict empiricist, okay, your empiricism will go wrong if you start your experimental setups with the wrong concepts. So you need to get these things right. So you have this fundament, the brain is fundamentally not evolved to be a computer, but it is a computer because it can compute because the theory of computation is about the brain originally. Okay, so there's no, it's not rocket science, and no surprise there. But then the other thing is this idea that the whole universe is a computer mainly goes back to people like uh, David Deutsch and, and Seth Lloyd, mm. um, pretty late 80s, 90s, and is, is a complete conjecture. Okay, so so Church Turing, the, the, the conjecture of Church and Turing just says that every concept that's well defined of computation is equivalent to a Turing machine kind of concept of um, computation. It's a conjecture because you can't mathematically prove it, but every time we try to define computation, we end up funnily enough with that concept. The Church Turing Deutsch conjecture, and you know, Deutsch called it a, th a thesis, but it's not a thesis, it's a conjecture, it's completely unsupported, is that computation is everything. Every physical process that's actually um, implementable in the universe is uh, computation. And this is based on a, a mistake, which is that you can simulate um, two ways in which computation has been applied to physics. And they're both very reasonable. One is to simulate, as I said before, which so this is totally okay, as long as you still know that it's a simulation, not the real thing. And the other is, of course, Landauer and other people have came up uh, to put limitations of what physics can do that are based on a physical notion of computation. They said, okay, so the world is only able to do so and so much within the time and the energy and the matter that is, is given the universe, you know? And so that's a very interesting application of computation saying that uh, the laws of physics allow things that are not actually possible, okay? But then it, it sort of turned on its head in Landauer's work itself, and the later Landauer is no, no longer saying, okay, so computation puts a limit on um, uh, uh, the, the universe, like Paul Davis as well, but they, they're suddenly saying, okay, the whole universe is a computer. Okay, but you have to um, know that this is completely unsupported by any empirical evidence, is a very recent conjecture that is completely metaphysical, okay? So here I use the bad word. This is not a scientific theory. It's a theory of metaphysics, a, a philosophical approach to the world and nothing else. So, so Chaba, I have three questions and I think how do you define computation with the it? Is the Turing machine and it's because he said it's a hypothesis, but it's not a hypothesis, it's a definition to, to talk about it. Hypothesis, it becomes when you relate it to reality in exactly. some way. Yeah. So right now, computation just means Turing machine, which is basically, if you are not a computer scientist, it's any computer is a Turing machine in a principal way. So anything that you see in a computer, calculator, or even other uh, devices, it can be even a mechanical machine that goes from A to B through, through calculation. So that's the definition of computation. I asked his second question last because that's the most interesting. Uh, his third question is, was that, okay, cognition is non-computational, but could that be well approximated by computation? Yeah. So I guess the answer is here's, yes. Here's an interesting yeah. philosophical problem, right? I mean, you can approximate most processes in the world. And now LLMs have shown us even our own linguistic behavior, uh, which is a bit embarrassing for us because... You know, we thought we were deeper <laughs> yes. than that, but that's... Okay. And all the linguists who didn't think about it. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's all right. And that's interesting. So don't get me wrong. So also when we maybe go and discuss AI afterwards, I'm not saying this isn't completely fascinating. This is really fascinating. What these programs can do is amazing. Mm. And also yes. uh, it's interesting to see when they fail and how it's completely unpredictable. And this is not unexpected. We, we have known this from genetic algorithms used in optimization. Um, way back in history already, and, and now these kind of uh, optimization approaches, this is no surprise, okay? So they hallucinate, and they ha hallucinate, it's such a bad word, but they get things wrong, and they make shit up when uh, you don't expect them to, right? And there is no solution to this. This is a fundamental aspect of those. Yes. And so I think, um, uh, so it's amazing what we've learned from, from them. But to mistake that, for a, a, how a brain works. That's just a step that goes too far. So the philosophical question behind this all is, are you happy? And a lot of computationalists are happy with just the perfect description of what's going on, a prediction 
but and they they don't care if it, if it walks like a duck if it quacks like a duck it's a duck okay and this is the Turing um, test approach and it's full of problems like the Chinese room um, um, argument John Searle has pointed it out first but it goes over and over it doesn't mean that what's underneath the system that's underneath works by the same principles now my claim here is that you if you actually get your concepts right okay you will get a completely different framework that has completely different empirical um, uh, consequences because you can ask completely different questions not because there is a single experiment that can distinguish so the, the, the question is always can you distinguish between uh, an algorithm that acts like a person and a person well you can if you are that person so if you try to <laughs> upload your mind to the cloud you will there's this meme that's now going around of this guy who uploads his cloud mind to the cloud and then he sits there and says when is it going to happen and they said well it happened it's not you in the cloud anymore because identity in biological systems is is a causal is defined by causal continuity it's not defined by mm. uh some sort of set of um, what defines you you know qualities that define you so these are misunderstandings that arise out of this principle you know, so is your aim to predict and control or is your aim to understand if your aim is to understand you need to worry about the semantics of your context uh, of your concepts so you need to get a bit philosophical. And my worry is that uh, the AI uh, field in particular, but many, many people also in biology have completely the wrong mindset now, where it's just about control and prediction. And that's a very dangerous thing, I think, for so many reasons. I see. But, it, okay, maybe we can separate two things, but, but the, the Popperian scientific method is based on sort of control and prediction right like your theories are tested by designing experiments and testing whether they falsify the theory in that sense there is this prediction machine there so popper and nowadays serves one purpose still and that is uh that knowledge is always fallible right but his idea that you can just it's so oversimplified this is not how science works so it's it's really important uh, and this gets me back to an earlier question you, question you have to why are computationalists so upset people computationalists are now people not that use computational approaches but that believe the universe is a computer they get very upset um, because they live in a small world and you are challenging the existence of that small world and that's an existential assault on them and the the problem is not computationalism itself but the what an adequate theory of knowledge is nowadays is one that is perspectivist right it says okay the world is out there but we cannot get out of our heads you know not as individuals not as human um, society um, we have a, a certain point of view a certain perspective and we see the world from that point of view and in the end what complexity means in such a, a philosophy is that there are many different ways of looking at the world they're all valid and especially there are certain systems that are very, they're simple. They're not complex. This is mecha mechanism, you know? So an algorithm works that way. Most of physics works that way, not everything. But if you get to the living world and the systems that contain organisms and, and are organisms, this is no longer true. And you can describe those systems in many different ways. And th these are all valid and we strive to be consistent, but they're not just adding up to a unified theory of everything. You know, the mm -hmm. world is much more complicated than that. So then you come back and say, okay, computationalism is one way to go about studying biological system. Mm -hmm. It tracks the constraints that build those systems. It's very interesting. But if it's suddenly becoming, and I use a term that was coined by philosopher Bill Wimsat, nothing but -ism. So the problem is not computationalism, reductionism, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. But it's when that becomes the only way to explain the world. And he calls that nothing but -ism. And he says, this is not reasonable if your worldview excludes everybody else's worldview. Um, it's becoming too narrowing. It's, you know, it's actually restricting the range of questions you can ask and, and the kind of insights you can have very much. And this is where we are, I think, right now. Yes, and, and, and I find the very paradox is that uh, people who claim AGI, AI, you know, becoming us somehow need, need to have the small world because the whole thing is defined in the small world. It only works in the small world, right? But if, if you're living in the small world, then that's it. That's of why they're convinced. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the doomer, the the AI doomers right now are exactly that. They for them, since you are nothing but a computer. Exactly. Um, of course, this comes out of it, and then you get a completely wrong assessment of the situation, in my opinion. Um, because if you look at it underneath, there are many, 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 many empirical um, pieces of evidence that that hint at the fact that organisms really are not like computers, and they do not behave. And, and this whole idea that what is super intelligence, superhuman intelligence, especially, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, so it doesn't mean anything. So well, we have to at some point talk about what intelligence is. But whatever intelligence those computers will de develop will not be anything like human intelligence. So it's not comparable. You're comparing apples and oranges. And the danger doesn't lie in. We wrote in one of our papers uh, the 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 you know the the danger doesn't lie in Skynet, but it will be Facebook. TikTok nowadays it's a few years old that paper that was killing us it's, yeah you're it's opening a huge box there but we can go there later yeah. uh, so I want to ask the second question of Chaba because it's related so I'm not even you, you tell me whether question makes sense but how can we test that cognition or anything else is non-computation yeah so again so it's not about having this killer experiment that shows you oh there is a ghost in the shell right it's about clean and clear thinking so what's what i'm doing here is an analysis of the history and the conceptual framework of the theory of computation and i'm telling you that it's not adequate for the job okay mm. rather than having this empirical uh, killer experiment that distinguishes between the two and what that does it opens all kinds of questions for new experiments that you can do so it has a huge empirical impact but it's not itself empirical. This is a philosophical question. And some people think that science will replace philosophy. Um, Stephen Hawking famously thought that, and he said, um, philosophy is dead. Well, that is a philosophical statement, ironically. And he didn't realize that he was actually keeping philosophy alive by saying it, okay, very much, because a lot of people read that statement then. <laughs> so this is the irony, there is, Dan Dennett says, there is no science without philosophical baggage. There is only um, science that hasn't taken its philosophical baggage on board. And I have to say, computationalism and reductionism in general are sciences that are have a strong belief that they are science through and through. They're, they're the only rational um, empirical um, approach to the world. But what I'm suggesting is a completely naturalist, and I have to stress that, na naturalist alternative that is better uh, fitting what we know about the world right now, then the computational reductionist approach. And it uses what we know about the world to create the philosophy underneath the science. So the funny thing here is that the philosophy creates the science, the science informs the philosophy. So it's an evolution, co-evolution of the two. And that's completely okay, but there is no grounding anchor underneath it. It constantly evolves. And so you just have to go with that. And this yeah, is something yeah. that's very unsettling for a lot of people, you know? This is just something that they don't like. Uh -huh. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, but we're not a lot of things. But one one thing I wanted to say: the very system that you describe in the paper is this kind of dynamic uh, evolution of two things together. And they yeah, and it's, yeah. it's yeah. A, even more than that. It's a construction of different processes that construct each other, and that's where they become uh, unformalizable. This is what people often worry about. So, yeah. So just just to close this part, so I still uh, want to emphasize that. If you live in a small world mm -hmm. and you in you don't have in among your toolkits, your tools in your you know backpack, the move to change the frame, then of course you don't see how another frame can be helpful. Right. And then other people will do it for you, of course, and you will live in their small world. Which is okay. I mean, we can we can remain scientists for thirty years and just live in the same frame and do good good work because Absolutely. the frame is good. Yeah, and then also people say, oh, but I can program my computer to have goals and and, and reframe and 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 all that. Yeah, but that's not the point, right? So the organism does that in a very different way. So the the computer, if you want a computer to set its own goals. And reframe they have to be implicitly co coded you still have a range of possible targets that you already hmm. uh, coded in you have a range of frames and then 
one definition of autonomy in AI is, of course, that the, the algorithm can autonomously choose between those frames. And the question is then, okay, are we anything else but that as human beings, right? And so there, I think we shouldn't underestimate ourselves because every being that is living and evolving, uh, and you have to imagine that we evolved from something that used to be like a bacterium, right? So in a way, we even grew, a bacterium. And we grew to an adult from yeah. a, something from that a looks a little, like an amoeba, yeah, yeah cell right and so we have this capacity of and even the bacterium has this capacity of doing stuff that is truly unexpected in a way that a computer is not able and so there is nothing mysterious there is no life force there is nothing beyond physics here except the laws of physics aren't broken but there are constraints higher level constraints that arise through the interactions of physical processes and those constraints build more constraints this is what this is the constructive side of evolution. So you have constraints building upon constraints and constraints and constraints. And the dynamics of those constraints is not determined by the underlying laws of physics. It doesn't break them. This is very difficult for people yes. to understand. Yes, yes, it's yes. Completely yes. compatible with them. It's like if you do a dynamical systems simulation, if you're into that, and you set boundary conditions. So it's basically the boundary conditions that evolve that are not under the control of the actual dynamical rules of your, your model, if you're a modeler and you understand what I'm saying here. So it's basically nothing that's not physical. It's nothing that's mystical, but it's not reductionist. So it's a non-reductionist uh, naturalism, like the one you want for the world. Uh, that There it is. And it's open towards the future. That's the other thing. So the computationalist small world is not, as you, you called it, a closed world. That's true. It has a closed future. And it's not predictable for any being within it because of the decision problem. You cannot predict if the computational process will actually terminate or not. But if there was a demon, a Laplacian demon, a monster that was outside the universe and would know everything and have unlimited computational capacity, it could still predict the entire future of the universe. And so we need to move past the demon and get comfortable with the fact that the, the future of the world is completely open. And it's great, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yes, yes, of course, exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and there is some kind of sadness in the small world in a certain sense. It's depressing. It's it, it's it, it's claustrophobic. Even though you have the, it's it's huge spatially, right? And it has the the decision problem. So you can't, you know, you can't predict it as a human being or any any alien that's limited and part of the universe. Any intelligence will not be able to to predict the future in practice but you still know that the future is set in stone and that i think is horrible i mean I, the, the other thing i want to say i i'm i you know i'm the 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 last one who will say it's not fun to be in the small world and solving problems that's like puzzles that are hugely exciting to work on and i like that but sometimes i think we need to uh, do the frame change and the frame change basically is, as you said, it's a creative move. And that's that's something that's, uh, um, let's say, empiricist. It's, it's just hard to, to understand for empiricists that what you do is that uh, a frame change will open up directions to do experiments that you would, wouldn't have thought about. And it, you, you definitely jump out of the Popperian framework. We just said that, okay, I don't know where the hypothesis come from, but that's exactly what we do as scientists. This is, yeah. should be easy for the empiricist. The empiricist does this every day. And because they're an empiricist, they're not being guided yeah. by law in the first place. So they, they constantly solve, they, they of all people constantly solve the problem of relevance, but they don't allow it as an as a, as a, um, interesting or legitimate explanation for what they're doing. Because of course it doesn't proceed to what we often define as rational criteria. So it's a bit something we like to, to sweep under the carpet because, um, so think about how artists work and how scientists work, right? Artists uh, and your partner is one, so you know that, they always talk about where their inspiration comes from and everything. And scientists only do that after a couple of beers at a meeting because <laughs> it's not, like formalizable and so it's a bit embarrassing if you're claiming that you have a sort of an algorithm the scientific method that is like considered an overall algorithm to find the truth so we should move away from this view of doing science science is a highly creative uh you know um art uh so robert rosen the biology the theoretical biologist called it the art of modeling and he says you know the way mm. you um 
first of all, pick out what to model. And this is relevance realization, right? Exactly. The frame you set, the, how you pick the variables, how you parameterize your system. This is the art of modeling. The map, the, creating the map. Creating a map, and you can yes, have different yes, maps. You yes. go through London and you have a city map that shows you the streets where you walk on. You have the tube map. The tube map's really weird. It's all distorted, idealized. Uh, that's what philosophers call idealization. It's not just abstract, but all the distances and the directions are wrong. But it shows you the <laughs> connectivity. This is what you need when you're on the tube. So you need different maps in a complex world. And the maps, if you put together the, the street map and the tube map, it doesn't get any better. In fact, it gets worse. <laughs> and this is exactly how science works. And this is scary for people. And it's uh, something we're not taught. You know, we need to teach scientists. Uh, the philosophy of science has progressed. People are always surprised to hear, oh, philosophy progresses. Yes. Have you read the ancient Greeks? Yes, we've had progress in philosophy as well. And the, the modern way of looking at how science works is just fundamentally not like that anymore. And we need to move there to, to have a clear view of where we're going. Of the territory and not the map, you know? Yes, yes, yes. So we're, so... we're really stuck in the map right now. It's a very good connection to relevance realization, but I just want to ask the last question, which comes from my good Twitter friend called Wildris. And I think we settled there, but he just said that it should be good to make the point clear that non-computational is not the same as not non-constructible. That is not being constructible as a purely physical system with no cause to things like panpsychism or quantum woo and stuff like that so it's so naturalist completely extremely right. important so this is yeah. it's possible to construct things that are not compu computable yes this is exactly it because the construction of many models of the world but also the evolution of biological organisms involve solving the problem of relevance which is not computational because it's a constructive process and the constructive process is based on constraint generation within the, the rules of far from equilibrium thermodynamics. And there is nothing mystical, nothing magical. It's not a form of vitalism. It's don't be afraid. It's just physics, but it's not your, you know, reductionist uh, bottom, bottom out on everything physics. Yeah. Yes. It's, yes. But it's not scary. It's, it's just a different layer of things. The universe is, first of all, dynamic and then. It's constructive. It constructs layers and layers of organization that emerge over time. And we're writing a paper about that too, the, this mm -hmm. organizational concept of organizational emergence, which is absolutely fundamentally unlike computational um, mm -hmm. uh, emergence, weak emergence. Uh, the, the emergence of gliders in the game of life is just uh, about computational irreducibility and the decision problem. But mm -hmm. organizational emergence is the emergence of new rules at, at new levels of organization. For example, the origin of life. With the mm -hmm. first cell that comes into into being in the universe the universe suddenly has a set of new rules and it's called evolution and you can simulate the whole of evolution at the level of quantum mechanics and you will have understood exactly nothing about <laughs> what evolution is about okay i will definitely want to go there we had the game of life that what is the analogy there and what where is the analogy yeah. Uh, ends but let's now talk about relevance realization because this is where we were before this last question where for me, that is the, the map of map making, some kind of like meta map making thing. <laughs> how to meta, construct meta map. maps. Yeah. 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 And that's a map about how to construct maps. And you have to be aware that it's probably not the end. Of, so you have to be aware that it's a frame too. But it's for me, it was such a constructive frame in the sense that you know when and if every you construct a map you will have uh, new corners there that you didn't think about and that exactly is the the role of a good map it's not only to get you from a to b on that map but also wow there is a c there that i haven't seen before mm -hmm. what is that yeah sort of like this structural thinking you know and so for me, relevance realization was that kind of map, map, map making map where I could hang a lot of things, integrate and open up. So it's it's also not a new idea, I have to say. So I want to give credit where credit is due. And there are uh, uh, communities uh, like embodied cognition and activism. This is an inactive mm -hmm. way, enacting knowledge in the world. 
it is biosemiotics. It's making meaning, making sense of the world, of the large world. So these ideas are framed in vocabularies and in methodologies that are very hard for uh, people to understand who work in AI and biology today. So what we're trying to do in this paper is also uh, with the concept of, so, so this is a translator uh, relevance realization. It's a concept that translates these concepts and grounds them in frameworks that we use every day um, in cognitive science, in AI, uh, in biology, and connects them. And so it brings uh, a lot of the, the results and the ideas from biosemiotics, for example, into research that finds that tradition very strange, yes? And so um, that's one of the aims that we have to bring those ideas to the a more mainstream audience and to connect them to the fields where at the moment humanity needs to have these um, discussions most. And I think urgently we need to discuss these kind of things, the nature of organisms versus the nature of machines and how to treat them in the fields of uh, AI research and bioengineering, of course. Okay, so this, this has practical implications. So why relevance realization? So relevance realization, so relevance is a concept like fitness and Anna talk, talked about this already in, in, in your podcast. So I'm not gonna go into this, but it's, it's the basic thing you need to know about it is, is radically contextual. Okay, so what makes you fitter in, in a given situation or what is relevant in a given situation cannot be predicted. Stuart Kaufman, who has co-authored one of my papers uh, with Andrea Rolli as well, is always saying you, the, the future of the evolution cannot be pre-stated. And what he means is you cannot even set up a list of things that may, there's no um, space of possibilities that you can write down uh, in a way that could be formalized into mathematics or code. Yeah, so it's it's completely impossible to do that. The space of possibilities of the universe co-evolves with the universe, and we cannot even know yet what kind of frames will come come out of that in the future. And this is what we mean by not computational. It's fundamentally not predictable, but it's also not formalizable. That's much more important. And I repeat this a couple of times during this podcast because it's so important. I think by shifting, people get very upset about computation, but actually we're making a much more radical claim here. <laughs> It's even worse than not just computation, it's formalization. So the world we live in, if for us living, you know, limited beings, it's no surprise. I mean, we are, uh, it's just a few seconds in the cosmology of the universe that we've descended from the trees and we think we can formalize the whole universe into equations. This is crazy, crazy thinking. And so this is a philosophy that shows you very clearly the limitations of that. And uh, relevance realization is at the heart of that because if you're in a small world if you're an algorithm no matter how many billion parameters your llm has it will live in a small world and it will never even encounter that problem it cannot reframe there's no way that framing will suddenly emerge from within the dynamics of those uh, correlations high level correl high dimensional correlations that exist in that model because it lacks the fundamental ability to 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 be motivated to set its own goals and so relevance realization, nothing is relevant to you if you, a few things. First of all, you don't have your own goals. So the first goal of an organism is to survive. Why? Because the organism is fragile. So Hans Jonas in the 1960s already said, if you're not fragile, if you're not suffering, if you don't die, then nothing is meaningful. And tell that to the transhumanists and singularitarians who are freezing their heads now. This is crazy. To live forever is a crazy idea. You don't want that. Look at Q in uh, Star Trek. I mean, he's such a mean person because he's bored to death because he's immortal. I and think it's so, even worse than that. Yeah. The the immortality thing because I think well, we can talk about later a bit yeah. about uh, collective intelligence. Is that I th there is there is a reason why there is death. And it's even if you just stay in an evolutionary argument. If you want to get rid of it, probably something else will die with you, like your community or whatever, you know, you're part of. So I don't think it's like even metaphysically possible to get rid of death. Death is part of this thing. It's no? literally unnatural. It's, it's, I, I always wonder about Solaris, you know, the planet mm -hmm. in uh, Stanislav Lem's um, book and, and the, the movie by Tarkovsky that is an ocean that evolved as a single being on this planet and it, mm -hmm. it evolved consciousness. So could that happen? And it's an interesting question, but even then uh, it would have phases of, of being, you know, it would transform itself constantly, right? It would 
to evolve, it has to change and it wouldn't be itself anymore. So even if you don't have individuals, it may be that evolution is somehow possible in a freaky world like that. But the kind of evolution we know on Earth is absolutely impossible without individuals that, that live, uh, struggle and die, because that is what is um, presented to natural selection. And if you want to evolve in a world like that, you have to be uh, this kind of dissipated far from equilibrium thermodynamic system that has to do constant work to exist, to keep on existing. And this is the second huge difference, of course, to algorithms. You um, you, you let the, uh, the chat GPT wait and it doesn't become impatient. It has no perception of whatever okay. happens in between prompts. And it's it's fundamentally different. So it doesn't have an interiority. It doesn't have motivations. It doesn't, it cannot want anything. I, I, I always, I'm amazed by how many people rea don't realize that an algorithm cannot, even in principle, how many billion uh, parameters you put into it, want anything. It's impossible to do that because to want something, it would have to make its own goals. And if it has goals, these targets were always given from the outside and it doesn't have this kind of self-manufacturing organization that organisms have. So it has no needs, it has no wants, it has no motivation. So maybe let's talk about this a little bit. I wanted to get yeah. there later, but... Uh, Sorry. <laughs> because no, no, it's, I think it's hugely important. But in my view, we can imagine artificial systems who want stuff to solve something that we give externally. So the, 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 I mean, the very, you know, paperclip maximizer is mm -hmm. we gave it an external goal and then it wants a lot of other things, for example, survive, because if it doesn't survive, it will not be able to make paperclips. So it can derive that goal from the end goal. And if the end goal is like high enough or whatever, you know, teleologic frame, framework you are in, it seems like, you know, that even living organisms might, you know, that 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 leads to like I don't know other metaphysics, but our goals might be derived from this higher goal. You see, so we seem like intrinsically developed goal like survival, but that's that that goal of surviving might serve another goal that we don't we are not aware of. Yeah. So don't you think that in this sense we can see de uh, develop? goal-oriented behavior in machines we can we have goal-oriented behavior in machines i worked with optimizing models for for uh when i was an empirical biologist uh, still and, and we used very models that were very similar hop field neural networks that were very similar to what's used now in ai but with uh 20 parameters not 20 billion that's the difference and so the 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 thing is yes the the, the question is not does let's not talk about purpose or goal but about function you know that's maybe more accessible so has does the algorithm have a function does the organism have a function yeah the algorithm has a function it's a tool so it's it has a function for the person the person who programmed it wanted it to make paper clips right the organism doesn't have a function as a whole um it has a purpose it is to maintain itself so everything else is derived from that so because without that, you don't get evolution in the real world. Okay, so the paperclip maximizer is a typical thought experiment that can only happen in a small world. It only happens in a simulated environment. Because what the paperclips uh, optimizer would would, ha would happen to it, uh, well, somebody would pull the plug, first of all. Uh, second thing is, uh, eventually, and very soon, actually, if you have a, a, an economic or ecological system where something gets out of hand like that, it will either get killed off by a competitor uh, organisms in the in the ecosystem or it will run out of resources very quickly so this idea of turning all the resources in the world into paper clips is something that came out of a very thoroughly uh, small world kind of point of view okay and it's not surprising it came from someone who very thoroughly is stuck in this view that the world is just a simulation or a but I, I think the idea there is that on the way yeah. To die because it will die at the end for sure and it, it will it will kill everybody <laughs> it can do you know, a lot of damage mm -hmm. but this idea that it could devour the entire um uh, ecosystem or biosphere is completely bizarre it could uh, happen but uh so if you're an organism that's very bad for evolution right so i don't know if we'll find things like that in the universe or if we just prove ourselves to be that 
a species on the planet Earth uh, to to be the humanity is the paperclip uh, terminator <laughs> of of uh, the ecosystem on Earth. It could be. Well, it's always uh, yeah. so. The problem is that I don't think that's a very good thought experiment, to be honest, because the complexity of the real world is, especially what's always missing there is this, uh, you know, very simple aspect of far from equilibrium thermodynamics. So to have a drive, you have to maintain yourself far from equilibrium, right? And if you if you sort of have a simulation, so. This is embarrassing for biology, but all the simulations that, that just simulate replicators like DNA without an organism and the evolution of that, that is something that can never exist in the real world, you know, because of the second law. It's just, it, it breaks the second it's law. It, it would be a total freak accident if evolution like that would happen in the real world. So uh, theoretician and physicist Howard Petit called this physics-free simulations because <laughs> they happen in a computational environment that uh, in the computers we have nowadays isolate the software simulation as far as possible from the physics of the machine it runs on, because you want to run as many algorithms as possible on your computer, and you want to run your algorithm on any computer that you have. That's a design principle. Whereas, and now we're already in this, the other paper, basically. Mm -hmm. So all organisms are not like that. They are embedded in their environment in a way that's immediate, okay? In a way, mm -hmm. so we experience the environment in a way that is much more immediate than the small world algorithm will ever experience mm. even if it's embedded in a in a in a robotic hardware because our software if we can talk about that at all is building our bodies and the bodies are expressing the software so it's it, it's all one process it's part of the same process and it's maximally integrated and in our software environments that we've created so far hardware and software are maximally separated and people think often oh that's not such a big deal but it is a huge deal because that is the, the, the physical reason why you experience a large world. Your access to the mm -hmm. world is immediate and preconceptual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because bacteria don't think, you know, they have no cognition, although some people claim they do. They have agency, but they, you know, to, to think, to have cognition, you need a brain mm -hmm. and a rather complex model of the world. And so that's my definition of mm -hmm. cognition and agency, because I think that's useful because somewhere in between the bacterium and that animal with a brain, something really important happens that we need to explain. And if we call all of that, yeah. I, mean, there's nothing I see, I see, I see. I, was, I, was, I wanted to ask this because I saw like Michael Levin and, uh, and Mark Solms speaking. And basically, I think Levin convinced Solms about the grayscaleishness of this thing, like uh, the bacteria, so, like agency and cognition is the same thing, basically. So, so. Uh, Levin is a nice example of what goes wrong when, when you take the computational metaphor too seriously. Mm. Right? So because he believes, first of all, that uh, intelligence and so here's an example, a beautiful example of someone just changing the meaning of words. OK, so he believes that everything is computation. It's a it's a pan computationalist pan uh, psychism. So what does that mean? So he believes everything in the world is computation. Mm. If there's input output processing. And so if there is erosion of a mountain, that's input output processing so the mountain has an intelligence okay so you, you can say okay why not you know and then also uh if we have a couple of other redefinitions and what's the problem with that so why am i so keen of saying i want to capture the the you know the transition between non-living and living systems why do i want to capture the transition between just basic agency and cognition and then cognition and, and um consciousness I want concepts, and I repeat that again from, from at the very beginning, that it's not like Plato said that they cut nature by its joints, but they do cut better as tools. So they're tools, these concepts. And we need concepts to cut at the right place. So if you just have this huge smear of you know, uh, calling everything intelligent, you get really weird outcomes. Like the weather is intelligent. That's what he uh, claims in print and also uh, sorting algorithms have agency is the newest. I mean, this is absurd from my point of view, simply for the purposes of what I, how I want to understand the word, this is meaningless. So hmm. it just means that the words have lost their meaning, okay, completely. And we want not just to predict. So the aim explicitly of his research program is just to predict and control. And he's very explicit mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And I think yes. it's com completely. Yes. It's, um, it's, uh, but wait, wait, because I, I, for me, I mean, I love his yeah. work. For me, that's just another map, which is not exactly your map because his goals are different. And also, 
his point of view is different, but it's a very constructive map. I mean, the stuff he's doing is 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 very out of the boxish because of his map. Which yeah, it doesn't fit his... the phenomena either. So basically, it's like a map from the 17th century with a sea monster on there that says "There be dragons." Because, so for example, you construct a bunch of mm. mobile 3D cell cultures that fall apart when they grow too large. Mm -hmm. And you make a press release that says these are um, bots. They, they call them bots, xenobots, now are, are, uh, anthrobots. These are not bots. These are cell cultures. They're blobs. They're highly variable. They have some correlation with the simulations they did with the physical conditions, so they can shape them a little bit. And then they say these are, uh, uh, you know, bots, biobots that can move, um, reproduce, and think. Yeah, they can move. I, I buy into that. They don't reproduce. They fall apart. That's not reproducing. They don't mm. have any higher level organization. And then at the end, they think, yeah, he thinks that seriously, because uh, know, him, anything that has input output processing is intelligent. Mm. Okay. But they don't think, okay, it's absurd. <laughs> so okay, okay. the no, absurdity, I, I... <clears throat> I don't want to like go, after, <laughs> this is a worldview, not a person that I want to attack here. So basically the, the worldview mm. is a technologist's approach to science uh -huh, uh -huh. and the technology uh, the technologist wants to control and explicitly wants to uh, for that needs to predict yeah but mm -hmm. there uh, the kind of understanding there is no understanding that comes out of that in the end okay so we do not so mm -hmm. what are the questions we want to have we want to understand why living uh, organization is completely different from these are empirical facts that we can observe okay so living um, systems are organized and behave in a completely different way than non-living systems. Is that a question that science should ask? Biology should ask? Yes, it should ask it. And if you have the, this kind of redesigned conceptual framework, okay, so you've you've implicitly re repurposed all the concepts that the, the the science of biology was using, and also you repurposed words like machine and they're no longer well if you will see the the, the words always mean what they're meant in, you know supposed to mean in a certain context but there is no consistent definitions they are flexible they can mean whatever so we live in this post-truth world and this is post-truth science the words can mean anything they they want and you no longer have a science that cuts reality by its joints and then uh let me just say one more thing and then i finish this rant uh, well, yes, <laughs> this is the same thing that befalls uh, the discussion about uh, LLMs right now. So huh. we have a discussion that is derailed by people, first of all, having different concepts, different people, right? So that's one problem. But then none of those concepts, neither on the uh, purely linguistic side nor on the other side of the, the, the AGI uh, enthusiasts and doomers, uh, cut reality by any joints at all. I think they're just uh, not the problem is not that they're wrong the, the problem is often that what is meant by those words is not clear it, they're not well defined so they're very large worldy exactly in my in my framework they're not actually mm -hmm. well-defined concepts that we can use for, to solve but, problems but but michael's goal is for example bioengineering and his point is a uh, very not much non-reductionist so on that side i think you're completely on the same side I think, and, wait, 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 no, he's uh, ultra reductionist because he reduces everything to electric fields and this idea that uh, no, no, everything no. is information. Yeah. Well, yeah, but he says that you cannot, for example, grow a new leg for somebody just looking at the genetic basis, and which is very much like a paradigm coming out of uh, biology. So, so he's he anti genetic says, reductionism. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, so he, he, he has a sort of layered ontology there and he has a very specific goal is which is not necessarily scientific in the sense that let's discover how the world works i think on the as a side effect it will have outcomes like that too but his goal is engineering so engineering is uh, you know he, he wants to understand the level of of developmental morphology and the electrical circuits of cells so he can manipulate them, he can program them. And mm -hmm. he does have a computational uh, paradigm. He just says that it should be applied at the right level. So I have three problems with that. The claims are overhyped to no end. It's amazing. So if you look at the actual results, they're not that impressive. The second thing is, um, this is insane, you know, and this is what we're doing with AI. We're 
yeah. gen generating technologies to manipulate um, biological systems. And we're generating technologies to manipulate our social interactions that we do not mm -hmm. understand the consequences mm -hmm. of at all. And we do this explicitly, like you said before, the aim is manipulation, not understanding. So we do manipulation in the absence of understanding mm -hmm. that spells doom to me and pretty soon. And I think it's an amazing difference uh, to science a few decades ago where, I mean, the whole biotechnology development that I witnessed is so unreflective. If you went to see Oppenheimer, you could see, I mean, they had the big bang, you know, of the first test and it was probably very impressive. And we don't have that in biology, it's very subtle. Mm. But the, the CRISPR genome editing, all these kind of technologies when unleashed to the outside world, which are completely unpredictable, what's gonna happen with those technologies, no matter what somebody claims, they will do some risk analysis. They will say, no, we found no risks, but there is radical uncertainty in those systems. But was it together. always the case with science? Like we didn't never knew where yeah. we were <clears throat> going. We have, like we just agreed on that. That's a beautiful world where this we is. have unprecedented powers and we move yeah. at unprecedented speed. So if you're in an area like that, you want to move slowly. You want to slow down. I'm a big proponent of slow hmm. science right now. And in these areas, we need to slow down. Also, we yeah. publish and research at the moment at such a speed that we can't digest anything anymore we need to slow down slow down right now and we need to think about our responsibilities of what we're creating and this is another problem this hubris comes from the idea that mm -hmm. you know humanity a very modern age idea and we're at the end of modernity very clearly in my opinion that we can be the masters of the world and we have created an increasingly complex world we cannot just unwind that again well maybe we will but it will be absolutely catastrophic so we want to move on and adapt to that complex world we need understanding we don't just need prediction and control because that if you understand complexity properly like in the framework i'm proposing you know that it's not possible and the only thing you always get from manipulating uh, complex systems like organisms and ecosystems and, and social systems is unexpected consequences you mm. always get those and they're rarely 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 good and sometimes they're catastrophic and we better get thinking about that right now okay. and i think um his mm. uh so this kind of biotechnological mindset um levin's mindset is is dangerous because it makes us completely blind to those kind I of see. considerations i see i see okay okay i i, I think i i I'll disagree on that <laughs> and i i also think like levin is uh, not i mean he's it doesn't have like uh, the whole scientific community behind him so it's slow because it's a small small uh, it's a big uh, like that, uh, so george church other people there's a certain kind of uh, I, I i think they're mainly biotechnologists so there's there's a bunch of people mm -hmm. who already started to do uh, uh, synthetic biology some of the mm -hmm. so people with a with an engineering mindset and i think the engineering mindset is often very good but in uh, this context, manipulating without understanding is, is fool foolish. Mm. Okay, so maybe because, because this leads to another topic mm. I wanted to talk about, because uh, my, one of Michael Levy's um, map is called TAME, Technological, Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere, which I personally find very constructive in mm. my work, because I start to see this sort of organismic engineering systems appear for example in telecommunication it will i agree with you completely that this will not be useful for an llm like one monolithic uh, ai because you don't see those kind of phenomena there but for example i work in telecom very let's just simplify and let's talk about two levels one is your phone and the other is the antenna and your phone is having a lot of AIs in them, trying to predict wh where you will go as the owner of the phone, what you will do, what the app you are, watch, uh, you are using will want. And so this is a very simple example. Let's say you're watching YouTube and you are traveling and the, your, your YouTube app just wants you to, to have the video all the time. So it asks for buffering more bandwidth or less bandwidth from the the antenna depending on its predictions maybe it knows your route so it knows that you will get into a black um, 
blackout spot where there's no signal so it asks a little bit of more buffering so this is this is happening you know if you look at like how the youtube uh, app asks for bandwidth it's it's a very chaotic uh, thing it's not something predictable so th th this is like the basic thing and then on you you, you can imagine now the antenna which has uh, very little control on the phone it, it cannot tell the youtube not to ask or not to do it can only affect it through sort of persuasion like soft control in the sense that it can give it a certain bandwidth doesn't give it all it wants and because it has to manage all the phones in the cell and so this two level thing it starts to have those kind of properties that uh, michael is talking about in team where you have agency like the phone behaves as an agent it, it wants stuff it wants to satisfy you it's no. programmed the, the goal yes. is programmed but somebody it's... somebody made it of course of course but but for, for all, that purpose. all engineering purposes it's an agent that wants the user to have a good experience and how to formalize it yeah it's, it's a lot of things but it still doesn't behave like a machine and then the antenna has to manage this this swarm of uh, devices that don't behave as a machine anymore so whatever the antenna does will change the behavior of the phone and you have this sort of like dynamic system that we see in living organisms that starts to emerge where it's really really hard to do anything like with classical engineering so it's very interesting because you used all these metaphoric words like thinking wanting asking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the thing is what you're looking at here is is uh, so as soon as algorithms get embedded into hardware that's out there interacting with people it is no longer it is an agential system not because it has agency but because there are agents around it so in a yes. way where depending on where you draw the, the 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 you know if you if you include the programmer into the computer system then yes the, there are intrinsic uh, purposes and goals but so mm. there are two different things so the the machine itself there's a question can the machine itself agi is about can the machine itself develop the kind of intelligence that humans have yeah my answer as you know from my papers is not in the way we're doing ai right mm -hmm. now and probably only if you engineer ai in biological systems which agi from a biological cell that you engineer from scratch alignment problem mm -hmm. so one question is okay do you want to do that i mean one but joanna mm -hmm. bryson uh, ai ethicist has told me this mantra that I, I keep repeating to everyone with a technology like that you always should ask first why you know yes. Sora Absolutely. Sora came out and I asked why this technology has no beneficial use for humanity at all it's just for advertising and for you know abducting people into a virtual reality that hmm. by the way there's this book called reality plus by uh, David Chalmers that comes out of this idea that the world is a computer again and it's completely insane if you read that book I tell you the difference. He says you cannot distinguish virtual from real reality. I can tell you one way you can distinguish real reality from virtual reality. It is what kills you if you ignore it. <laughs> but then, of course, those algorithms, those systems are embedded that you told me about. And they're not embedded the same way an organism is, but they interact with organisms that have purposes. And so they are in massive techno social, uh, uh, you know, political systems. They're, they're mm -hmm, embedded mm -hmm. in a huge context. And of course, so what uh, this tame framework is 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 totally getting wrong is is this right? So it draws it just read. So this is a perfect example. Thank you for bringing it up for for redefining concepts in ways which are really not helpful. Because instead of recognizing very precisely what the hardware itself actually does, and what the difference is to the non-hardware actual agential parts of that system, it blurs completely uh, the, the the difference between a machine and its context. So I have when I talk about a machine. It's either a mechanical device in the traditional sense that actually implements, it can be modeled by an algorithm, its purpose, its function, but, um, or it's, a, it's equivalent to, it can be simulated precisely by a Turing machine. So if you define it like that, then it's useful. It may be too restrictive, but look, we have created no hardware software so far that doesn't correspond exactly to that definition of a machine. And mm -hmm. uh, Levin's repeated claims that, that machines have moved on and, and are no longer behaving like machines are simply wrong because that only happens when you have the interaction. Take an example, AI art. You know, what's the art in AI art? It's first of all, in the data set of a massive amount of stolen artwork, 
that the, the AI was trained on. And second, of course, it was uh, in the prompt that an agent gave the AI. And so the art in AI art is in the agency of the human being that interacts with it. Plus, plus the reception. Yeah. Don't forget that. And that the interaction the with the audience. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that, there you have a perfect okay. little microcosmos of where you can see where these small world systems are embedded in a larger world. Mm -hmm. there, there is no problem with that, but there's a problem in mistaking then saying, oh, we can create machines that are like that. No, that's not what we're doing. We're placing them in a wider environment where they uh, interact. Mm. The self-driving car, again, classical large world problems. There will never yes. be a self-driving car that's entirely safe. It is already safer now than most of us driving, but we will never solve the problem that you have a perfectly safe car, only if you think- No, you're... no, but but it's, yeah, yeah. it's the same thing as you say in your course that, uh... You know, as as soon as we go into synthetic propositions, the <clears throat> we can never have certainty. Yeah, it's it's we dealing with the world, but it's it can it can still be useful. And as a as I, I'm never saying an engineer it's not useful. Was, hmm? Yeah, I'm never saying it's not ah, useful. Yeah. I'm saying it gets so just dangerous, bad and or, dangerous or, when or. it becomes a universal approach and a universal view of the world. Ah yeah. yes, no you yeah yes of course yeah. But I don't think like like they claims to to be a metaphysical map. <laughs> so uh, well, with, it's always difficult to tell because it's never really worked out. Uh, that's another problem. Uh, part, papers are published so quickly; they're not really worked out properly. Mm -hmm. But the if you try to figure out what's going on, it's it's a, a it's an ideology, yeah, huh. and it's it's a very American <laughs> ideology. Uh, all these discussions about regulating AI right now and Europe is eliminating itself from the race. Maybe Europe will be the only place standing because it regulated the AI. Uh, I mean, have we thought about that? I don't know if it's a good thing to to continue the race. No, but you're bottom. talking about uh, AI or TAME? No, so TAME is no. this uh, frontier uh, ideology that it's always good to rush forward and to uh, see. So, so I have hmm. two problems with TAME. So first is this techno feasibility ideology behind it you know so if we consider the world like that everything is feasible we can control the weather we can control the biosphere we can control everything so that's one thing that disturbs me and the other thing is uh, it's it's just it's just a turing test on steroids in the end i mean it's all based on reproducing on mimicry right so it's a it's a it's a it's a conceptual framework that's completely happy with producing something that looks like what it's supposed to you know and that's that's the same with the Xenobots. They look like they were, uh, you know, they look like they, they move and reproduce, but they don't really do, do it. And so you can, can I empirically disprove that? No, they fall apart and then there's more of them. So they reproduced in a certain sense, but this is not an <laughs> empirical question. The empirical question is, as a biologist, I know what reproduction is and that ain't it because reproduction is the, the passing on of the organization of a living being to next generation. I think generation. that Michael is about extending this through analogies and metaphors, and you it's can you can you can say that it's uh, dangerous, perhaps, and too fast. Yeah, and you but... can say it's it's sloppy in terms that it, it doesn't define its terms, and it doesn't it doesn't aim. And then the other the third thing is it doesn't aim for understanding it really, right? I mean, it claims to. That's it's it's it claims to to to, but it doesn't. It it, it, get, yeah, uh, I think that I think the what it shoots for in terms of understanding is is how these emerging things work, and yeah, but that's how the thing. you interact with them. So the paper is not written yet, but we're just writing a paper about computational versus organizational uh, mm -hmm. emergence, and the, the the kind of emergence that's important is in biology is organizational emergence. Um, that whole framework doesn't have that in it because it's a small world okay. framework. Yeah. Okay. So I it's think missing... it's just you know trying to push boundaries further and it's see missing... where where it where does it fail. Yeah, yeah, but that's what we're doing in um, the kind of AI research that's now claiming um, uh, you know LLMs scaling the model. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. You know, and so it's, that's it's, the equivalent. It's actually okay. good to point out the fundamental issues, but yeah. at the same time, I'm, I'm you know I got uh, blindsided by LLMs too. Like in 2015, I I wouldn't have thought. That it would go this far, I have this all this you know, I'm equipped with the philosophy of science now to know that it's probably the hallucinations not, not will not go away and it's 
a feature, not a bug. And but I also find this analogous to how our perception works, where we do hallucinate stuff all the time. We just match it with reality. Like a, the, my example for for hallucination is that you're driving in a dark street and there are buildings and you don't see the crossing street. You hallucinate the car there and you slow down because that's that will kill you if it's really there. It's not there. You think it's there. You behave as it was there. And then you arrive and look and it's not there. Okay, you update the system, you continue. Mm. So these things, uh, for me, are analogous to this. And in that sense, they could maybe be used for the same purposes, not <clears throat> as living beings or conscious beings, but as part of like a, a model of a robot or a model of a car which has to hallucinate. And it has to be coupled by sensory input to ground it to the big world, the, rea the reality. So, so this is these are kind of things we are, you know, thinking about, and a lot of people are thinking about is that, okay, they hallucinate. Let's try to not take it as truth, but as a proposition, as a hypothesis, if you want. It's analogous to like a scientific hypothesis when they say plan something, and you have to check it. So, so for me, they're much more a tool than uh, a, a way to understand human, uh, you know, uh, well, th certain aspects. Again, I mean, so I went to a comput computational neuroscience um, uh, conference and, and people were studying the visual system. It's funny, they all study the visual system, right? Because funny enough, of course, all of that, you know, the work of Gibson, Marr, all these people, you, this is inspired by our visual system, why? We just happen to be not dogs. You know, if a dog were, you know, developing this, it would be all about smell. Okay, so it's interesting then that it surprises anyone that our AI is like the you know, visual system. Of course, it was inspired by that, the whole uh, development of, of, of uh, Hopfield neural networks and all these kind of things came out of these layers in the, uh, in the retina and, and things like that. And so the the... So this is, uh, I think it's much more useful uh, and also much less dangerous to, to look at these things as tools, very powerful tools. And no, I'm not going to say it's just like a hammer. Uh, I'm going to say, okay, so we should think about them, not like AI, but IA, in intelligence augmentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we use them to increase, then we have a completely different business model. So we will use these tools to, so what is really bad about our brain, right? Um, it's short-term memory. What did evolution do there? Okay, we never had the use of more than, what is it, seven? It's not true, I know, but more or less <laughs> uh, items in our short-term memory and, and not billions like a, 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 an LLM can, mm. can hold. And because of that, we're really bad at discovering higher level correlations. So the action, uh, the output mm. of an LLM, I shouldn't call it action now that I've uh, ranted about them not having agency. <laughs> The output of an LLM is uh, miraculous to us because it can do all these things that we're famously bad at because evolution never mm -hmm. selected us to be good at them. And so that's great. It's so cool because it complements what we are bad at, right? So so let's try and, and have a completely different um, uh, sort of uh, paradigm there. And we say, okay, so, so let's use them and do these things. Where, where, and so even... Okay, so let's then take an example like choosing the music with your, uh, you know, home entertainment system. I have a bit of a problem with that because, okay, so first of all, the good thing is, of course, the system has all your preferences in its short-term memory, while you don't. And so the song you really want to listen to is, is, of course, whenever you want to listen to it, what was that band again? You know, I mean, I, I never remember. So that's really annoying. So this is the tool that helps us do that. But at the same time, so it shouldn't be interface design, right? It shouldn't be playing what you want without you asking it to. It should wait for you to ask, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a different thing because then you're just using it to refresh your memory. But in this case, it's just playing, suggesting stuff to you. It's taking away your agency. And then people say, okay, so how is that different from a calculator? Well, the calculator is long uh, division. It's just computation that you do in your brain. And so the calculator doesn't take any agency from you because it only takes away computational aspects of what you do mm -hmm. anyway. But these LLMs that we have now, they take away creativity. They, they now uh -huh. create our art and so on and so forth. And I think there we have to be really, really, really careful. Yeah, because 
this is the wrong way. I mean, if we decide to give our agency away to machines mm -hmm. that have none, that is the danger mm -hmm. that I see. And we don't need AGI for that to be dangerous. This is dangerous enough because of the, the um, business model and the societal context that we have, mm. not the, the nature of the algorithm. So again, it's not Skynet, it's TikTok that is dangerous. Ah, absolutely. Yeah. No, this don't get me started on this. Like, <laughs> the, like and then the AI is older and more mature <laughs> because LLMs are like, I don't know, three, four years old, but yeah. uh, like TikTok AI is like 15 years old and it's right. really good. And it's, you know, it's, it's blending in because it has more agential flavor. Yeah. LLMs, they talked to Laura um, Di Paolo the other, you know, like the, the four weeks ago. I still, I have to watch that. That's great. Yeah. I yeah. And she, she said that one, one, we, we were talking about like why LLMs are so alien. Yeah. Uh, and she said, it's because they seem to want to satisfy us all the time. And that's so weird. Like we start like thinking about like projecting, you know, agency in it. And what do they want? Like all these sociopathic people behave like this, you know, they want something from me at the same time. So that's very alien. But this also means that uh, they don't blend in yet. Yeah. Whereas <clears throat> social media AI is there to take your attention. It's very, very, very well uh tuned to that of course it's trying to solve an unsolvable problem because of the time scale i don't know yeah and the, the story with facebook is that i got hooked on uh, cage fights videos yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, you were telling like, anna the other day yes yeah. years ago and then two things happened one i it really pushed me out to do it and it was a, it's a huge benefit to my well-being so there was some kind of therapeutic consequence which is another story but the, 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 the first story is that i deleted facebook from my phone yeah. and so they have this 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 dilemma that's unsolvable on time scale because they can they can get you stuck on the screen that's their goal right but on what's time scale like 15 seconds a minute a day then 10 years or for a lifetime or multiple generation those are very different things to optimize. And one of the things we do with, uh, with opponent processing is to constantly tune the time scale on which our action depends on, right? Do, do, do my, right now there is a lion I have to run. I will not think about, you know, what will I eat in uh, two weeks. But if I'm doing agriculture, you know, I, I do think about a year ahead and my actual action today is about uh, doing some agriculture over, right? So, and that those things depend on the situation. It's very much this relevance realization thing that you cannot predefine. And so Facebook, TikTok, they all face this dilemma because their it's algorithm cannot optimize not op it's not optimizable at times it has to be like a living organism and it's not yet <laughs> i mean this is crazy because uh, the so this comes from the fundamental assumption that intelligence is prediction and optimization mm -hmm. right i mean they go together and this is a very again a very new uh, kind of idea that mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. very old and it is not uh, true because it's in the real world it's it's completely impossible to optimize and uh real world survivors organisms that survive have as you say they have always a bunch of strategies that they play against each other and can adapt this is exactly what adaptable behavior at the individual level so uh, behavioral adaptation and physiological adaptation is about you have a whole repertoire uh of actions that you can employ and uh this is something that is again you can mimic it in an algorithmic system by having a set of, of strategies mm -hmm. or even a meta strategy that builds strategies. Mm -hmm. But no matter how high meta, meta, meta you go, you will have to program at some point that thing in. And this is what evolution does for organisms. And then you have to understand that evolution is not just an algorithmic um, process, but it's this co-constructive process that we mm -hmm. describe mm -hmm. in the paper where mm -hmm. uh, these different um, um, processes they influence each other in a way which is not just feeding back on each other but this building each other so so neither yeah. of those processes can exist without the other and so i think if you look at it this way uh stuart kaufman has developed this first in his book investigations in the year 2000 already but um also in his more recent work and uh, the paper we wrote together 
and it is this 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 constructive he calls it the adjacent possible and that's the idea mm. that the evolution is so, constantly moving into a new possibility space and that possibility space you cannot even write it down beforehand before the world is actually there and, and generates yeah you have to realize it yeah it, right? the, the possibility space mm. also the formalized possibility space is part of your model of the world and mm. is not part of the world oh, i see i see, I see. Uh, so so uh, i think these distinctions are not just uh, well philosophical that's what scientists say oh this is philosophical and it's something that's not important <laughs> or not answerable <laughs> and i think these philosophical, or i don't understand <laughs> this is is a philosophical question exactly but it's it's important it's it's really important that we deal with those questions now for me i think a lot of the danger of what we're doing right now is that these questions have been pushed to the back burner mm -hmm. and they lead to dangerous developments and what the outcome you can see in the development of biotechnology that we discussed and also in the development of ai in the way AI has been, and AGI especially, has been discussed this year in a very hostile environment where uh, we cannot actually sit down. So if you take a six month break, I don't think that's possible, but then we sh should take it to actually sit down and think about the concepts we're using. And I don't see anyone doing that. I've been trying to have my voice heard in this discussion, but nobody from biology, if you look at the whole AGI discussion this year, uh, nobody from biology had any say in this uh, saying and all the the, the hmm. understanding thinking um, uh, intelligence agency all these words come from biology and mm -hmm. nobody ever asks a biologist what what do these terms mean here in this context right so it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's it's weird and I think we are not aware just how ill-defined a lot of those concepts are and <laughs> that we are not actually aware of what we're talking about and then things happen like this um ai engineer freaking out hmm. thinking his ai has gone conscious on him right and writing an email to all of google and they're getting fired that's tragic because that's a, a, a fundamental um so john verveke has this idea of the agent arena relationship mm -hmm. so what we're doing right now is we're driving ourselves in a completely derailed agent arena relationship humanity mm. is literally i think is a very dangerous moment in our history we're literally losing grip on our actual uh you know landscape of affordances so that's yeah, sort of that's... the landscape of meaning that the actual world is there and has for us because it's not yeah. very pleasant it's full of problems and we manage the technology that gives us just enough of an illusion um, of living in a predictable, safe world, a small world, that we can actually completely retreat into that. And that is certain doom. I can tell you that. Yes, We yes, have yes. to confront the like, large world out there, and we have to confront our fear of this openness, of this unknown and unknowable um, world out there. And this is something that uh, these frameworks, computationalist frameworks, like the TAME one and others in AI that we've discussed, prevent us from seeing. They make us blind. Hmm to those hmm. uh, uh, aspects of our struggle right now. So let, let me, let me, yeah, I completely yeah. understand what you're saying. And I hear a lot of fear in this, like fear of the unknown and the, the, the speed with which we are going into the jungle. But there is like, like my story with Facebook is another, uh, from another point of view, it's an example of this where like even LLMs, like they, they are a giant mirror yeah, 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 and they project you back what you project into them, and a certain sense they can help us to realize our livingness, our humanity by 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 contrasting it with something, you know. And so, like Tatiana was another host, uh, guest of me who said uh, that. The difference between Netflix and real art is that what they want on Netflix and on a TV series, like a, a good one, but not a, not a genius one, is to, 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 to you to come back because there's the business model. Whereas real art is showing you a film and pushing you out. Don't come back, go and live. <laughs> right? I watched that and I love that. So that's, I have an art project going in parallel to my uh, philosophy and science projects. And uh, yeah. we're, we're oh, this is fantastic. This is a, 
a, a great example. I really like the mirror. So again, we could use it. Mirrors are tools. So we could use <laughs> uh, AI as a tool to look at ourselves. And I think yeah. this, uh, the Gemini disaster, it was a big <laughs> lost opportunity. There. Baby, look at ourselves as society. That right? was a very ugly mirror we got back. Comes and then, back. <laughs> what was the Microsoft? chatbot on Twitter called Tay that got yeah, that racist was, in yeah, 24 hours. Really so, right. you know, these things should make, yeah. you, make us think in ways that are more just than just a, a laugh, a good laugh and a meme. And uh, but for that, we need to reconceptualize. So I, I'm really worried about those voices that mm -hmm. are actually a small coming from a very small community. But it's very con, you know influential in Silicon Valley and in these circles of strong computationalists, especially those that adhere to things like the simulation hypothesis and other nonsense like that, that is complete philosophical, pseudo philosophical nonsense, and uh, are basing their AI safety movement, for example, on, on a completely mm. uh, deluded worldview, mm. okay, which is yes. having completely lost the grip between agent and, and arena, I'm afraid. And <laughs> it's not rocket science to figure that out. But it, we have they have so much voice at the moment that the the, the discussions are derailed. Uh, and as you say, we could use these algorithms as a, as a mirror and, and look at ourselves, or we could even use that discussion and how it went down and analyze it and say, look, guys, this is not how such a discussion should be had. We need to, to sit down. We need to think this through. We need to, what are we talking about? What is the nature of the algorithm? What is the nature of the human being? And that's difficult to do because human beings are the worst place to start thinking about consciousness and cognition and all that because we're very very complicated so it's much better to start like kevin mitchell always says in his wonderful free agents book you need to go all the way down and start looking where does agency arise and how does it arise in non-magical ways and then you will find out it arises in non-magical ways but in ways that are not implementable in in current it um algorithmic technology yeah and then mm. people say, oh, do you have empirical proof of that? It's like, no, I have concepts that show me that if I look at the empirical phenomena, that they're different phenomena you know, that we're talking about. So when you say intelligence, when you say your AI thinks or understands this debate about semantics in, in um, uh, AI right now is crazy because, of course, the semantics is still correlational in a in a in a. A large language model while our semantics come out of our need to survive so that's relevance mm. realization and so when we talk about semantics in ai and semantics in organisms we talk about completely different kinds of things mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i know i, I see yeah. that i see that yeah i see that but I, I still think that a lot of concepts that come out of your paper and from kevin mitchell's mm -hmm. uh, book and others, and I put Michael Levin there too, are could also. I mean, I'm I'm in AI, and I I don't see those things even think thought about, or very little agency and mm -hmm. uh, and goal orientation and these these hierarchical systems where uh, you don't control everything, and this, this could be useful there, and maybe it would be even useful to to drive the AI technology into the direction that is more relatable and this is where you know John's program comes in where we want to align AI by bringing them up mm -hmm. you yeah, cannot yeah. bring up an LLM today because it's so alien but you can bring up AI systems that are you know in your toaster you know? yeah well you bring them up by designing the interface in a way so it extends your own agency and intelligence and it doesn't start mm -hmm. to dominate so yeah. you're not giving your intelligence and your agency away. But if this is market driven, it's hopeless because people <laughs> want to give their agency and intelligence away because they're, uh, we're all uh, lazy when we come home after work because we're exhausted and we want this technology to, to, to you know, yeah, yeah make us into receivers, consumers. Yeah. And it's, it's this, hmm. I mean, so many people have, have, have predicted this, Marshall McLuhan and, and um, among many, many others. Uh, that this was going to happen. It's not surprising. It's not even like it's it's obvious because, again, these people also already saw that our nature is not that complex. Mm -hmm. And often it's pretty predictable what human beings will want and what they will do. But the problems you see are always large world problems here. They're not mm -hmm. some super intelligence arising from AGI. They're not um, 
solvable within a computational framework. They're about employing these technologies in a large world that is not a computer. It's a complex world, a large world that has unexpected consequences all the way, all, always. So what do you think about the distinction between intelligence and rationality that would map on those two, like intelligence is problem solving capacity mm -hmm. in a small world and rationality is the ability to set the problem or ask the question or set the framing? I don't like that like either it. because, I mean, the biological concept of general intelligence includes things like reframing that we've talked about, ah, but us, using common sense. So common sense requires shared experience. That mm. is what humans have. And as you say, uh, AI is alien, so it doesn't have a shared experience. So it cannot use common sense. It's a very, there's a lot in there in that. Mm. Or um, dealing with ambiguity. And I, I don't mean just a bunch of options, but real like confusing input. And or unknown uh, unknowns, eh? Unknown unknowns and all these kind of uh, things. And so I would be very reluctant to, um, so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about a general intelligence. So I see. I think uh, intelligence is a trait that you employ and to, to be rational, to act rationally. And acting rationally mm -hmm. doesn't mean just following a, a bunch of logical rules, but acting rationally is to choose the best action in a given situation. Mm -hmm. So that framework is, is, is okay, but that doesn't follow just from inference, mm -hmm. from logical inference or some mm -hmm. kind of optimization. There are all kinds of other uh, factors that go in there. Your mood, uh, you know, um, other stuff that happens. Which and is also a signal. <laughs> highly dynamic. Yes. Yes. Okay. But it's highly dynamic and co-constructive. Mm -hmm. And this is the mm -hmm. most important point. All of these opportunities that you have, your actions, everything co-constructs each other and that's why we say it's not computational which means it's not formalizable again and again and again i have to drive this home saying non-computational means it's not formalizable in advance so what you're doing as a living being is you're constantly engaging in yeah. solving the problems of relevance so you do relevance realization and you're formalizing um you're you're defining problems that you want to solve and yes, you do this yes. if you're a bacterium and you do this in a very different way, much more sophisticated, using your brain, hopefully, most of us, if you're a human being. <laughs> or, or the whole body. <laughs> Better, yes, yeah. even that. Intuition, whatever that is, don't ask mm. me, please. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> I, I think we went a big circle. There are a lot of other topics. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit, uh, I just wrote down, like, who are you? <laughs> Can you, okay. you, you like, where are you coming from? Because you're... You seem to have a lot of um, knowledge about various domains, which are maybe like in the reductionist scientific thing, it's unconnected, like biology, AI, and philosophy. So how did you meander through all these, uh, these domains? I, I started out as a pretty conventional um, biologist um, and, you know, became a, a modeler. So I started as an empirical biologist and then we uh, did model optimization, reverse engineering of networks. So we used a lot of the tools that people are using. Um, we, we, we fit these little hop field networks to, to data with simulated annealing. This is a nice example too. Simulated annealing is not real annealing. You know, there's no heat involved. You don't <laughs> actually lower the temperature while you do that. So it's a nice example where you can say, okay, this is uh, a metaphor for, for yeah. The hmm. thinking in the in the hmm. uh, chat GPT is also not thinking exactly in the same way as we're not actually lowering the temperature in annealing. So I've always been fascinated by these things. And then I hmm. became fascinated by the limitations of modeling in biology, which got me into this uh, thinking about what is the organization of the organism as a whole. And I discovered these maverick scientists they are really lonely people that uh, are still interested in this kind of question. So I'm, I'm listing a few here, Robert Rosen, Umberto Maturana, Francisco Varela, Stuart mm. Kaufman, Howard Petit, um, uh, Alicia Huarero, uh, Terence Deacon, people who are pretty much on the fringes of biology. So biology is not very interested in what life is at the moment. And this is, or, you know, I don't know, <laughs> NASA is, but for different reasons. So basically I got interested in these uh, theories that mm. Uh, also, I should mention uh, Alvaro Moreno and, and Matteo Mosia and colleagues that are doing work in this field. So they are doing theoretical work about what it would take, what kind of organization does the organism have to have to, to be able to do what it can do uh, to, to self 
manufacture. There's a beautiful model that uh, my colleague Yanni Hofmeyer has done where he has a model of the actual cell, the biochemistry of the cell in terms of this uh, scheme by Robert Rosen that is famous because it says the cell is not computational, but it never mapped onto anything in biology. So these models are now being mapped onto real systems. And it's an exciting time because mm. we can make these theories. It's hard to do this. And ultimately, you can make them empirically testable. And the empirical test may have to be to create a living cell from scratch. I <laughs> still, again, you have to ask the question, why would you want to do this? It seems like an extremely dangerous experiment to do to me, but it will also, of course, be extremely um, fascinating to really understand from scratch what it means to build mm. cells. So from there, the philosophy you see, because you immediately get into questions, why can't I model a whole cell? And, and um, so, yeah, that, that is my uh, little story there. But then you became a philosopher in a certain sense, right? No, yeah, well, I'm a biologist <laughs> using philosophical approaches. Um, I'm see. still interested in uh, biological ideas. I like this term of the natural philosopher that we all were. Uh, uh, you know, the term scientist only came up in the late 19th century. Before that, everybody was a natural philosopher. Mm -hmm. And Newton, all these people, Leibniz, which is interesting because Leibniz is now considered a philosopher and Newton is considered a yeah, scientist, but they would have made no difference between their uh, profession at the time. So this is my aspiration. And uh, I was inspired by my mentor, Nick Monk, in this aspiration. He was the, always, when I was a master's student still, he, he said, we should have natural philosophers again. And I think yeah, that's, okay. that's something that's really true. Yeah. And anything along the lines of, of John Verbakis when he says uh, when you're a philosopher, it's not about just philosophizing, but living the way. The lived philosophy. The lived, so, yes. so there's a paper about Wittgenstein that says doing philosophy the bloody hard way because, you know, <laughs> he, he quit. He wrote this book where he solved philosophy, then he quit philosophy and then became a terrible, terrible, terrible teacher. And then <laughs> came back when called and wrote a second book, which was only published posthumously that, re you know, re rejected everything he said in the first book. So this, he really had this life experience and lived mm. his philosophy through that experience. So I, I think we need to move philosophy out of their academic department um, and have people. So I give a, I do sell and give teach this course in philosophy in for, for scientists, because not, it's 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 exactly it's it's not a bug it's a feature that i'm not a philosopher i'm a scientist because i want to give philosophy as a tool to scientists not for them to know who was this philosopher and what did they say but to use philosophy as a tool mm -hmm. to reflect and i think the the question of the aspect the constructive aspect of science where do our questions come from our motivations is extremely important and is neglected and we should talk much more about that because it's mm -hmm. a really in, incredibly fascinating topic and incredibly important i think it's just as important to choose the right problem to work on to mm. choose solve the problem of relevance as a scientist mm. uh, yes, as it is yes, to solve yes. the problem <clears throat> that's afterwards yeah, yeah. relevancyization as a tool <laughs> to know why you want for to your own work to... yes yeah. it's not just academic yeah. philosophy it's useful philosophy yes, yes i that's that's exactly my yeah. relationship with the john stuff Okay, wow, a uh, lot of stuff. Uh, so I usually ask my guests at the end to ask me one question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, after all the discussion <laughs> we had now, I'm really, really curious where you want to see AI going the next few years as an AI researcher yourself. Hmm. Now we just wrote a position paper on embodied AI. <laughs> so you, you <laughs> please it. tell me more. This sounds scary very... and interesting. Yeah. It's very, very basic yeah. for you or whoever knows like embodied cognition, but because it's meant for the community. And it's there is a growing community in AI who wants to see AI to go out in the world, not just stay in the, the LLM. Robotics is typically uh, one domain and there you, you got your wish granted because it's slow robots break <laughs> they are they live in the large world like uh, self-driving cars so it's that's probably a very similar 
path like the exponential goes very much into sigmoid in, in that, that right. world because yeah, yeah, yeah. you have resources it breaks you know a robot uh, falls it's ten thousand euros and the month of repair you know oh. and if you see that like the sometimes you see these these videos where the first thing you do with robots you put pillows on them so they don't break themselves <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's also a test Mm -hmm. Putting together physical systems with AI is a test, and there are a lot of things. I mean, Boston Dynamics does an excellent job, but they use very little AI. They start to do it, but it's mostly classical control and mechanical mm -hmm. engineering. Mm -hmm. What they do, and it's, I mean, they, their robots really look like uh, very, like, you know, the difference between the, the Boston Dynamic robots and the, the Tesla robot is. Boston Dynamic is like a young guy in his 20s doing parkour and the Tesla robot is like an old guy. <laughs> but it really, you know, because, because when you get old, you don't want to lose balance. So at every point in time, you want to be in balance because you don't have the dynamic thing to, to catch your own fall, which is what we do when we walk. And so those robots are, are, are like that because they want to stay safe, but it's so nice to see it in like so such embodied way, you know. That so so robotics looks like us. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you know, when you get old, you know. <laughs> and so robotics is one of them. But the other other thing is like uh, some one thing we did on this paper is to extend embodiment into any uh, system that has agency, mm. which can they can and, and live lives in a in the real world, but the real world doesn't have to be our 3D world, like a telecommunication antenna lives in frequency world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't. So I don't think we it it, it it will take a lot of time to get the the thermodynamics the thermodynamic separation and all that stuff, which is an attribute of living systems and the the, the autopoiesis. It will for a long time these things will be physically engineered. Yeah. But in the behavior, there will be a lot of things, I think, that will come from the embodied cognition uh, inspiration, doing those stuff that I was talking about, like trying to manage a fleet of uh, AI, other AIs. What about Neuralinks? Huh. We should be careful. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that. <laughs> I am not against experimenting with these things, especially when it helps people to, to walk again. So mm -hmm. I think anything is okay as long as it's slow. Right. Yeah. And it yeah. gives time for us to adapt. We are very plastic yeah. as, as individuals and as societies too. It's the speed that kills us. So you don't mean slow uh, development, research and development, but slow adaptation of your brain towards the added everything and yeah. slow. I mean, it's but it's I think it's naturally slow because it's so mm. hard to do. Yeah. And so any research that that has the sort of like the physical constraints is naturally at a speed which I think we can manage to absorb as a right. society. Yeah. And I think even LLMs will slow down. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll see. I mean, some people are like uh, saying to me that GPT-5 will be AGI and, you know, like they already have the religion in open here to deal with this. Even even more slow is broken. So these linear laws never hold up, you know. So it's uh, eventually it has to plateau. On yeah, I mean, the, 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 the data is all fed already into it. Right, right now it's like eating its own tails, like which is a very nice image from, you know, <laughs> mythology. And... Um, and uh, I don't think that will improve it. it. There will be maybe it's so, also one thing I think it to make them smaller, less costly, and small to put into devices. Edge, but that's more optimization technology mm -hmm. development than than a breakthrough like the, the 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 surprise that they were acting the way they were. Right? Yeah. Ah, so you you asking me what breakthroughs I'm expecting? No, I didn't like, specifically. I, I'm very happy with the answer you're giving. <laughs> because those are typically the things that you cannot predict. That's what you know, exactly. I wouldn't ask you that. <laughs> that's exactly that. Uh, after the saying for thing, like, two hours that uh, that's not possible. Yeah. yeah.
but but I, I yeah I, I think there there will be needed something on the embodiment front like a similar breakthrough or uh, some some of my uh, friends colleagues uh, say that hierarchical planning doesn't have the right architecture yet in your net mm -hmm. so the fact that we want to plan long uh, activities we make it hierarchically we have big steps smaller steps etc and there is no neural architecture to support that sort of that, uh, yeah. behavior and that could be like a like a nice little breakthrough which you know it has everything ready it just has he needs a mind with the spark <laughs> and right. the, the, the 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 money behind to train it the same way as dark transformers were invested in yeah yeah, yeah 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 that's that was all scaling up basically yeah, yeah. yes but you needed the algorithm Right. It, yeah. it was always like that in AI that, uh, yes, we needed scale up, but we needed the algorithm and those two like co-creating each other yeah. and the hardware, because do you need it? I mean, and the data. So it's like maybe three or four things that were, were building themselves up. Right. And, and so when I teach deep learning, it was, it's always the GPU, ImageNet and the algorithmic ideas. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Yogi. It was a nice conversation. I'm pretty sure we'll come back because I I want to talk to to Michael, and maybe it would be nice also to get you guys to talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I I have no problem with that. You we'll see. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and. Um, yeah. It was a pleasure, and I have to say I've never covered that many topics in two hours <laughs> while recording the conversation, at least. So it, it was a huge pleasure. Thanks for doing yes. this and inviting me. Okay, thank you, Yogi. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye.